and Sarita Lily White, and I'm the CEO of Transparency International Australia, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be uh, moderating this session, a uh, very important session on how foreign bribery undermines democracy and human rights and why enforcement is needed and victim ri victims' rights should be recognised. I'm joining this call from Melbourne, Australia, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land that I'm on. Um, this is the Wurundjeri people and peoples of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Our discussion today is really very timely um, to kickstart the Summit for Democracy, but also in recognition of International Anti-Corruption Day, just around the corner on the 9th of December, and International Human Rights Day on the 10th of December. Bribery and corruption is not a victimless crime, and too often it's the most marginalised people and communities that are disproportionately impacted, particularly women, girls and Indigenous peoples. And so after my almost 30 year career working to improve responsible business conduct, integrity and good governance, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that corruption and human rights violations frequently go hand in hand. And in recognition of that, the discussion that we're about to have is really going to put a spotlight on the negative impact that foreign bribery has on democracy, but also on civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights. And so I'm delighted to be joined by this stellar panel. Um, and together we're going to consider some of the data on foreign bribery enforcement, some case examples on the harm caused to victims, and how this could and should be addressed uh, and compensated for in foreign bribery proceedings. So to help set the scene, uh, Transparency International's well-known and famous exporting corruption report, the most recent one in 2020, found that only four of 47 countries that we looked at, which did include 43 of the 44 um, uh, parties to the OECD Anti-Bribery anti Convention, are actively enforcing against uh, foreign bribery. So it's only four out of 47, an incredibly low number. And further, many of the cases confirmed that bribes are in fact being paid to high level officials and political parties, which of course undermines democracy in the most fundamental ways. So how, how are we going to run the event? Well, firstly, I will let you know that we are actually going to uh, be recording this session. So I, I hope that's OK with all of you. But just to note in terms of uh, your responses, the event is being recorded. We're going to start with two questions to each panellist, and I will need to be tough on time. So if you see me holding my hand up like this, uh, fellow panellists, that's uh, it, it's a warning that, you know, you really need to wind up that response. And then this will be followed by a QA and a session. So for all of uh, those of us joining the call, please use the chat function to write your question. Um, and, uh, and if it is to a specific panelist, pop that in there as well. Uh, and then I'll moderate those questions. So to begin with, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first panelist, uh, Drago Kos. Uh, Drago is chair of the OECD Working Group on Bribery, which of course monitors states' compliance with obligations in line with the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention. And just by way of update, recently the OECD Working Group on Bri Bribery held some pretty difficult discussions on the issue of victims' rights in foreign bribery proceedings as part of an update to the OECD Anti-Bribery Recommendation. And that update was adopted by the OECD Council in November. Um, I think it's fair to say, regrettably, certainly from the point of view of Transparency International, the NAYS did win that day and uh, victims' rights were not included. But uh, it is worth noting that the preambular text the harmful effects caused by foreign bribery and considers the importance of effectively combating foreign bribery in order to assess, address and prevent uh, those effects on society. But it doesn't go far enough in our view. Um, Drago has a distinguished record of international public service, 
He's a past chair of the Joint Independent Anti-Corruption Monitoring and Evaluation Committee in Afghanistan and past chair of the Group of States uh, Against Corruption. And uh, interestingly, in his home country, Slovenia, uh, Drago was the first chair of the Commission for the Prevention of Corruption and also a FIFA UEFA, UEFA uh, referee and he's still a referee observer, which I was very interested to learn. So Drago, uh, over to you. Um, firstly, based on your experience, is foreign bribery really damaging the levels of democracy, which really is part of the premise for our meeting today? Well, thank you, Serena, and uh, let's say best regards to everybody online. Now, uh, I would not thank you for, for opening my wounds again on the accommodation you know, and the issue of the victims. But uh, you see here in the working group on bribery, we really deal with, with uh, many different cases of uh, where, let's say, bribe payers from one country were paying the bribes to individuals in other countries, sometimes even the guys at the top. And we know, you know, in general terms, we always say that corruption is destroying the democracy, democracy from within itself. And since this is what we're dealing with is the foreign bribery, it's even more dangerous than the domestic corruption due to the fact that the bribe payers usually they do not take care about the consequences of their bribes in those countries. And uh, we have a numerous number of cases, let's say, when we see that countries which already achieved something in the fight against foreign bribery uh, started to go backwards. Some, some of them not they're not going backwards. They're, I would say they're running backwards. And this all has consequences on the level of democracy there. Uh, we see lately that there is a basically it's a very direct, direct linked link between the willingness of countries to fight not only domestic but also foreign corruption and the level of democracy there. Uh, unfortunately, in the last year, we see the increase, increasing number of countries where the so-called autocratic regimes, which do not care too much about let's say, the human rights and liberties, they do not care too much about the, the democratic values, are gaining, uh, let's say, the importance, and we have more and more of them in the group, but also outside of the group. What is especially dangerous with when we discuss the effects of foreign bribery in, in let's say, some countries is the fact that if the individuals who are receiving bribes want to conceal this fact, especially if they want to conceal the consequences of the bribes, which usually goes in favor of foreign foreigners, then they are forced to use much brutal ways, much more brutal ways of concealing their deeds, including completely neglecting or even directly misusing democratic processes in their countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, we see in some of our member states, let's say that really uh, it doesn't take much that all the safeguards or uh, let's say the, the established practices which have been brought in cumbersome for many years can disappear in the number of, let's say, the number of weeks, if not days. It just depends who is the person at the top. So uh, we are forced to use more and more our famous Article 5, which is, let's say, basically asking countries to follow the rule of law when fighting foreign bribery uh, without any exceptions. Uh, but I would say that without uh, a strong reaction from the side of the group, but also from the side of all international community, I'm afraid that for some years uh, situation will get even worse and we have everything possible what we can do to prevent this from happening because otherwise we will see even more democracies crumbling because of different issues but also because of bribery because the bribe payers are using or misusing the current situation at a large extent. Mm. Well that's 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 a fairly gloomy picture you've painted for us there. I, I, just as a follow-up, I, I wonder if you um, could comment on the extent to which uh, you've seen victims actually being compensated for harm caused by foreign bribery 
and whether or not you've seen any changes in the, the confiscation uh, angle uh, in terms of um, the proceeds of foreign bribery being confiscated? Well, since you mentioned already at the beginning, you know, that we did not manage to introduce uh, uh, concrete provisions on protecting the victims, uh, you can imagine that there is also nothing in in the either the convention or the 2009 recommendation which would help the victims. So mm -hmm. we do not enter those discussions very often in the working group on bribery. We hear from time to time uh, when countries, let's say, explain the cases where where they were uh, really doing uh, things to assist the uh, victims. Uh, but uh, can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but uh, you have disappeared from my screen, but um, uh, I can certainly hear you. So I, I think press on, Drago. Well, I will try to, to get back. Oh. Yeah, well, so as I said, we don't have many cases where countries would explain even formally or even informally that they have assisted victims. We hear from time to time cases where countries are complaining that the, the funds which have been uh, sent back to countries which have been damaged by corruption have been again used by the by the corruptors. And that the, the problem the countries have to, let's say, to reestablish or, or let's say to make, make it uh, absolutely impossible for the corrupt guys from whom the assets have been confiscated, that they will not get the, the exactly the same assets back. I do recognize that this is a threat, that this is a challenge, but I still think that this threat is not strong enough that we will simply avoid compensating the victims. So what we have to do is we have to precisely define procedures. How should we deal with those compensations and not forget the compensation? And uh, speaking with countries which are which have some experience in this area, I have to say it is possible. They all recognize that, but there is a bigger problem which I see. The bigger problem is that simply sometimes they don't want to do it. And this will be, let's say, the the the, the most hardest nut we will have to crack. So mm -hmm. it's not so much about technicalities of uh, returning the, the the confiscated assets back to the victims. It is about how to convince the countries which are confiscating those assets that they will do it. Of course, yeah. we have countries which are willing to do it. We have countries which are doing, doing it on a regular basis, but nobody wants to, let's say, nobody wants to get very uh, popular because of that, because everybody is afraid that they, they will be facing even more requests for compensation. So it is yeah. a thin line, but again, I'm confident that we can find solutions. Great, and I'm glad glad you still have optimism uh, around this. And uh, I certainly concur with you that uh, political will is a very hard nut to crack. Um, our next panelist, so thank you, um, Drago. Our next panelist, uh, Anita Ramasastri, has been really making a difference throughout her international career. And uh, Anita brings a business and human rights perspective to our discussion. Anita is the Henry M. Jackson Professor of Law and Director of Graduate Program in Sustainable International Development at the University of Washington. And she is the immediate past chair and still current member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. And uh, in that working group, she leads the work stream that really integrates the two aspects of both responsible business conduct um, and, and preventing uh, uh, corruption and ensuring respect for, for human rights. So Anita, welcome. Uh, Anita, you, you've heard what, what Drago's had to say. Um, what do the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and indeed the agenda of the working group tell us about state and multinational uh, obligations with regards to foreign bribery and victims' rights? Great. Thank you so much, Serena, and thank you to Transparency International for this invitation. I am someone who comes out of the anti-corruption world, but have turned my attention to this parallel world of business and human rights. 
And I should say, it's not just the United Nations. You know, Drago works with the working group on bribery, but there's uh, also another part of the OECD, which is focused on responsible business conduct. And the OECD guidelines really ask companies to think about responsible business as an integrated agenda, that you need to prevent corruption, but you also need to prevent human rights impacts in your business operations. The cornerstone of that is what I implement through the UN, which is the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. But I want everyone to realize that what we're saying here is holistic responsible business means that companies need to account for bribery and, and prevent bribery, but also need to realize that that very often their activity also has a strong human rights impact. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but just to say the UN Working Group appointed by the Human Rights Council, as we go around the world, we go on country missions. And what we've noticed around the world, so throughout all of the regions, is that when we speak to communities that have suffered human rights abuses, whether it's a dam that has burst or there is a failure to conduct an environmental impact assessment, and now they're suffering the consequences in terms of pollution and health hazards, or whether it's pharmaceutical supply chains where bribes have been paid and medicines have been diverted. Around the world, when we speak to communities using the human rights lens, so we're there to ask them about business activity that has had a human rights impact, what we often find is that they also speak about either petty or grand corruption, right? Either companies mm -hmm. are paying administrators to circumvent mm -hmm. regulations, or you have, let's say, a security guard who's paid a bribe and is then detaining a human rights defender. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, while in the anti-bribery space, we talk about victims, but we don't document the harms. If we look in the business and human rights space, the harms are well documented. And perhaps we don't have the concrete evidence of bribery, but we have mm -hmm. longstanding community impact. So I just want to say that I think it's important for us to connect these agendas because, again, it will help us understand how foreign bribery and private sector bribery does undermine human rights uh, across the globe in a way that is, and again, subverts democratic processes in terms of, of what we're seeing. Um, so I would just say that I think that aligning the agendas and that and really focusing on how business and human rights and the UN guiding principles, which require companies to look at their human rights impacts, needs to be integrated into a stronger uh, kind of corruption prevention agenda. Mm. Now, I think you make some really important points there about uh, you know, a cautionary tale about siloing the way that we address these areas of work. Um, just by way of follow up, uh, you, you touched on then your missions and I, I wonder if you could just share with us a little bit more um, what you've heard or what in terms of some of the cases that you've seen or been told about um, that show the negative impact of foreign bribery on, on human rights and what would be your assessment on how there is both enforcement of foreign bribery and also um, uh, recognition and, and, and uh, protection of victims' rights in, in practice. Yeah, so a couple of things there. One is that I think it's very important for the human rights community um, to continue to advocate for strong anti-corruption measures at the intergovernmental and at the national level. So that's one piece, which is that we need advocates in from the human rights space. But in terms of cases, and I'll just mention one, I mentioned a few kind of examples of what typically happens, but we have in the situation of the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, the situation of Dan Gertler and the bribery allegations, and of course, sanctions were levied against him. There's both the human rights impact of failure of DRC to collect billions of dollars in terms of payments, right, because of the, the bribery leading to underpayment into the, into the Treasury. But what you see in the human rights side is that there's now cases that are being mounted about direct impacts, that the quality of the mining, the safety, the way in which people are actually impacted by the mining conditions leads to much more direct human rights impacts to the communities that are either mining, um, impacted and living near the mine. And those are, I think, the more direct human rights impacts. So that the treasury piece is certainly a human rights issue, but it's really that direct consequence as well that mm -hmm. we need to document more. But I'll just conclude mm -hmm. by saying what's important here is that while we talk about anti-bribery and, of course, the OECD convention, we also have um, the, the UN guiding principles were voluntary at first for companies, but now we have the European Union, France, the Netherlands just announced a couple of days ago, binding mandatory human rights due diligence, mm -hmm. meaning companies are gonna have to, similar to anti-bribery, institute procedures and controls to prevent human rights abuses in their activities. Why is this important? Well, hopefully, it, again, it'll be another way of getting at the same issue. If there's corruption linked to this, then processes will have to improve. But most importantly, 
is this idea. And the Netherlands has said that they're going to introduce something called a statutory duty of care and civil liability. Mm -hmm. So that while you, a prosecutor may or may not investigate the allegations of foreign bribery in these cases, victims themselves will have direct standing in home country jurisdictions to seek mm -hmm. remedy and reparations for the harms that they've suffered, which might be monetary, mm -hmm. but might be injunctive, right? That you want the mining to stop or you want permitting processes to be improved. So I just want to say that I think that there's a lot of hope, I hope in, in terms of robust human rights due diligence serving a strong corruption prevention agenda. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, the, the, the developments and the trends that we're seeing in, in, in mandatory human rights due diligence, I think the, uh, the anti-corruption an anti-foreign bribery world has a lot to learn uh, more generally about the importance of undertaking robust due diligence in, in terms of not, not, not just identifying corruption vulnerabilities, but really looking into the integrity and character and track record of all of the, uh, their business associates throughout their supply chains. Um, and I think it's no surprise that uh, we when you look at sectors like mining that you mentioned, in large-scale infrastructure, dams, of course, these are sectors that are not only most prone to business and human rights violations, but also most corruption prone as well. Um, so thank you very much, Anita. Um, our next panellist is, um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ed Edson Cortez. Uh, Edson is the exec, and I hope you're still with us, Edson. I can't see you on my screen, so um, uh, hopefully you are here. It's just a glitch. But Edson is the executive director of uh, Centro di Integridade Publica, or CIP, SIP, or, or also known as TI's uh, chapter in, Mata in uh, Mozambique. So um, great to have you here, Edson. Um, in May of 2021, um, SIP and the Norwegian uh, Mitchelson Institute produced a groundbreaking report um, just titled Costs and Consequences of the Hidden Debt Scandal. And this report looks at how a hidden and corrupt loan to Mozambique, a guaranteed loan of US $2 billion, actually cost the country US $11 billion and uh, undoubtedly, you know, exacerbated poverty uh, in, in the country. So um, before we turn to the actual report that you co-authored, uh, Edson, can you tell us a little about what's the state of play of foreign bribery in Mozambique in general? And perhaps you could just touch on a couple of cases and the impacts, including the impact on, on democracy and human rights that it's had in, in, in Mozambique. Good morning and thank you, Serena. Well, in Mozambique, we have uh, this type of cases related with, uh, with corruption, viable corruption. And um, I will try to nominate three cases. Uh, and the impact of these cases, because this is a loan, that the government contract uh, with the foreign uh, banks, for example, uh, digital migration uh, in Mozambique in 2030. Uh, a Chinese company won the, the, this tender without any kind of, of uh, with the direct adjudication. And uh, the company is, is well connected with the daughter of the former president of Mozambique, Mr. Armando Gebuze. And we have also the construction of the Nakala airport by the Brazilian company Odebrecht. If you heard about Lava Jato scandal, you heard about Odebrecht. So Odebrecht built a, a huge airport in Nakala province without any uh business plan and this is a huge uh, uh, white elephant in mozambique no one used mm -hmm. this airport it cost more than 100 million us dollars the former minister of finance mm -hmm. is involved in in this kind of and we also have uh, the the problem with embraer is a brazilian uh, aircraft builder they sell three aircraft to mozambique company ireland and the, the former Minister of Transport is sued and now is in jail 
because of this, because the, he won $2 million uh, in this scandal. All these scandals, uh, the government asked for loans to, to be involved in this uh, contract, to pay these companies. And after this, they need to pay the, the debt service. And if the government need to pay the debt service, they don't have money to invest in the, the social areas as education mm -hmm. and health. And we, here in Mozambique, we know that if you have uh, some money and you uh, suffer something, you are uh, some disease, it's better to go to the private sector, to private sector instead of to go to the public health service because if you go to the public service uh, health you will die because you don't uh, find the medicines so this is a kind of thing that we suffer here because of the lack of investment in the public service because the government have a lot of uh, loans mm -hmm. and they need to pay for the uh, Mm. Uh, you might have just dropped out there, Edson. I hope you come back on in a minute, but I think you make some um, really, you know, really important points. One about, you know, just the the impact of corruption and particularly in, in, in infrastructure sector uh, that can end up in uh, white elephant projects. But also, yeah. of course, the so, the very fundamental issue that the bribery and corruption, you know, is really robbing oh. a country of money that is needed for essential services. Um, and I'm glad you're back now. Um, just a follow up question, yeah. I, um, Edson. Now turning to this uh, infamous tuna bonds or hidden loans case, what, what did your report find in terms of the harm that it, it caused? Well, this is the huge uh, corrupt scandal in Mozambique related with the and that is the scandal that uh, started in 2012 until 2004 when the uh, the private invest, the private invest uh, Lebanese company joined with uh, Credit Suisse and VTB they arrange a, a, a huge a big uh, uh, scam with the police get more than two billion dollars and after the, the in 2016 when the the american uh, funds of investment start to complain about the the, the money they invest in Mozambique don't pay the money uh, this scandal appeared in the media so, and uh, when these appear, Mozambique will receive more than $400 million from the uh, international donors for their budget. They, they, this kind of modality we call, they, we call uh, budget support. And when the, the donors uh, knows the details about this, can they suspend the, the aid? And this aid goes to the social areas. So, and from 2006 until 2009, Mozambique's uh, uh, the donors cut the budget support until now. Uh, more than two million Mozambicans uh, go beyond the poverty line, and many companies, uh, small medium companies, close because they uh, they uh, won tenders with the government with the state and the state uh, they they don't have uh, an, enough money to pay the the tenders and we start to to see the tension the political tension because some people in the political elites they benefit from from this scam but other people in the political elite and they don't benefit and they suffer also with the huge economic and financial crisis. So now we have a trial for more than 19 persons, including the former minister, former, uh, the son of former president of Mozambique, Armando Gebruza, who won more than $33 million in this scandal. And all of people who are 
it belongs to the inner circle of President Gebuza. They won a lot of money with all, 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 all these kind of. And after the audit, uh, crawl audit, they don't understand where seven hundred dollars finish. So this is uh, uh, the point of situation now, and the the we we have a, a, the, the 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 we are fighting in we have a trial here in Mozambique in UK in in Switzerland mm -hmm. hello can you hear me yep i can i can hear you yep we can hear you okay i think you you've Frozen a little bit there, Edson. Um, can you hear me or just give a thumbs up if you can hear me? Otherwise, perhaps we'll come back no, no, to you. No, no, I, I, I can hear you. I can hear you. OK. Well, perhaps if, perhaps if you just um, uh, one more one more minute and then wrap up and then we'll move on to Sue. Well, I, I, I think I'm done. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Summarize. Thank you for that incident. And that was coming. Yeah, no, we, we, we certainly got all of that. And um, I guess, you know, really what you've you've described to us is is really the really disastrous and tragic consequences that this case has had. And I think it's a watch this space in terms of the cases, uh, uh, certainly in the UK. And I'm sure our next guest, Sue, will be watching very closely to see what happens with this case uh, in the UK. Um, so we're going to now to turn to have a look at a couple of the major exporting countries, uh, the UK and France, um, looking at the, the supply side of foreign bribery, if you like. Um, Susan Hordley, welcome. Um, uh, you've got your job cut out for you, tracking that case clearly uh, in the UK. Um, Susan is the executive director and founder of the UK NGO Spotlight on Corruption and was previously the founder and policy director of Corruption Watch UK. She's worked on anti-corruption issues in the UK for, for nearly two, two decades and is very well known and, re and respected um, beyond the UK borders and her, for, and her work in this area. So Sue, welcome. Um, the UK, a, a common law jurisdiction, has been a leader in some respects in terms of recognising the harm caused by foreign bribery. Um, the UK has com compensation principles and has made a few awards. But can you really tell us about just how well that's worked? How was compensation calculated, you know, even roughly? And, and what were some of the avenues that have been used to make that compensation? Thank you so much. And thanks for your kind words, Serena. I'm really pleased to be part of this discussion. Um, and uh, Drago alluded to the painful <laughs> process of uh, victims not being recognised in the last round of OECD discussions about um, uh, the new recommendation. And it's a, a pity because actually the UK's compensation principles came out of the 2016 London Anti-Corruption Summit, uh, where the communique specifically recognised that compensation can be, and I quote, an important method to support those who have suffered from corruption. Um, and so the UK developed compensation principles in, in June 2018 for their prosecuting and investigating bodies. So that's a serious fraud office, National Crime Agency and Crime Prosecution Service. And these principles are quite groundbreaking. I mean, they require and commit the agencies to identify who can be regarded as a victim, assess the case for compensation, obtain the evidence and ensure that the process of paying compensation is fair, transparent, accountable and avoids further corruption, which uh, cuts to another the point that Drago was raising. So ha but how have they really worked in practice? So actually, all the most significant compensation claims happened before these principles were introduced. Uh, um, mm -hmm. so you had a situation where uh, we've had $4.6 million paid to Tanzania under the first ever uh, deferred prosecution agreement, then a smaller compensation uh, to Kenya and Mauritania by a company mm -hmm. that Bribing, uh, bribing electoral bodies to win printing contracts for electoral um, material. And then the largest ever, most significant ever compensation order was 11 million 
pounds to Lithuania, which was actually 50% of the contract price. Okay. So these really significant good compensations. I mean, the Tanzania one was 21% uh, of the overall uh, sanction. The Lithuania one was 60% of the overall sanction. Mm. But what happened next? You know, so in 2016, there was suddenly silence. You know, they produced the compensation principles, but nothing was happening. And we had a five-year gap with some very, very big uh, bribery cases. We had Airbus, we had Unit Oil, with no compensation at all. Uh, until finally in July this year, uh, there was a, a the construction company Amic Foster Wheeler. There was a, a amount of two hundred and ten thousand pounds was paid in compensation to Nigeria, but crucially, this represented just zero point two percent of the overall fine uh, sanc- mm-hmm. the overall sanction paid, uh, and it wasn't paid to any of the other five uh, countries involved in um, that bribery scheme. So overall, mm-hmm. you've had. Seven deferred prosecution agreements for foreign bribery in the UK, which resulted in settlements of £1.4 billion and compensation of £4.8 million paid. So that's just 0.34% of the overall amount has ever been paid in compensation. And it isn't any better with criminal convictions. In fact, it's worse. Uh, so I think it's worth, you know, up on Edson's very powerful uh, presentation there, uh, that there was a recent case where Credit Suisse was fined in the UK by the regulator and they imposed a fine of 147 million, as part of which they required the bank to forgive 200, uh, um, 200 million dollars worth of debt. But overall, the 350 million pound fine went into UK and US treasuries when, as Edson was pointing out, you know, people in Mozambique were forced into really abject poverty by this bribery scheme. Mm. So I don't want to, um, I mean, I can tell you, you know, in detail how compensation is calculated. It's very limited. It's very much about, you know, whether a contract was inflated, the goods were delivered, and it's only ever about the amount of the bribe paid, which is why we've seen very, very small amounts generally, apart from the very groundbreaking Lithuania deal, which has never been replicated. Um, What are the barriers, very briefly? The key barrier is actually not the prosecutors, it's the courts. And in the UK, the case law is you can only do compensation in simple cases. So the bottom line is foreign bribery is never simple. It's always complex. And the more widespread, more egregious the bribery, the more complex, the less likely compensation is to be paid, which is a very unsatisfactory situation, which we've been pointing out, that we need a legislative amendment in the UK to address. Second barrier is about how it's returned, which Drago raised. And I think the important thing is, you know, we do have some really effective principles from the Global Forum and Asset Recovery on how to do this. That shouldn't be a barrier, as Drago says. You know, this can be done. Uh, It's not being perfectly done. We have lots of questions about how the UK is doing it. But one very final comment I want to make is really the narrative around how money is returned, because what we're seeing in the UK is money is being returned, particularly from civil recovery cases, but it's being returned with a big bang of aid and patronage. You know, here we are, we're Mm -hmm. making a generous Mm -hmm. payment in the Kenya case, you know, which fundamentally undermined democracy in Kenya. A very small amount was paid and was You know, Boris Johnson, our now prime minister, went to Kenya and he said, we're spending this on ambulances. Uh, And the company involved put out a big press release saying, we have helped buy ambulances in Kenya. So the company that paid the bribes, that fundamentally undermined democracy in Kenya, was allowed to use it as a PR opportunity. So there's some real Mm -hmm. issues about, you know, how do you make Mm -hmm. sure it's a operation? Uh, and not uh, just patronage and, and, the, and the northern countries being generous with this money. Mm. No, I think that's a really good point that you make, that it's uh, the risks of it being turned on its head and becoming a PR exercise for the company um, is, is a really valid one. And, and certainly, I mean, I was really shocked to hear that you know, the more egregious and widespread the bribery, the less likely the compensation will be paid. I mean, that that is a fundamental problem that we've got if if we're only tinkering at the edges and it's the the sim- simpler, smaller cases that are being compensated. But just um, quickly, Sue, I, I just wondered whether or not you think there's scope in the UK for victims other than the state to be recognised. You know, this issue around individual victims as well. 
<clears throat> so this is this is a really key question. I hope we can get into a really meaty discussion about it. Um, I mean, for some time we've been pushing UK prosecutors to look at community impact statements in bribery cases, not least to um, make jurors in criminal cases, you know, interested and excited by these cases, which could otherwise be incredibly dry, you know, reams and reams of financial information. And, you know, there's getting the voices of victims heard in UK courts and the harm really represented. Uh, it's a real uphill battle and we're not winning that one, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, I mean, I think the other case um, uh, is we've been highlighting the discrepancy between how harm is identified. So in individual cases, they recognise that harm includes undermining the proper functioning of government or public services, but that harm isn't reflected in the corporate um, assessments of harm. So the courts take a very, very narrow view in the UK, and they're very reluctant to expand the definition beyond the state. Um, and prosecutors really are a bit bound by that. You know, they can try and bring mm -hmm. test cases. It's very hard. I think the key test is one that relates to um, something I need to raise, which is a case in the UK involving a, a company, a mining company that paid bribes in the DRC, linked to the Gertler case that I need to mention. And uh, in that case, some quite groundbreaking work is being done by a, a colleague NGO that we work with called RAID, Rights and Accountability and Development. And they brought forward 16 individuals to the SFO to be compensated who were affected. This really raises some very interesting issues about when is corruption individualised? When is the harm of corruption individualised? Or is it always really a community harm? Can you actually find individuals and do you create unintended consequences uh, by that? You create a kind of gold rush to the compensation of individuals which might leave other people out. So that's a kind of key difference, yeah. I think, between human rights and corruption. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for that. And um, all power to Raid and Patricia Feeney, who have been leading this work uh, in the DRC for many, many years. Um, so thank you very much, Sue. Um, our next panellist, I'm delighted to welcome Caroline Gousset, a legal counsellor from the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, welcome, Caroline. Um, I should add, Caroline is uh, an active um, French representative in, in numerous international fora, uh, including the United Nations, the OECD and the G20. And she's also previously practiced as an attorney uh, specialised in white collar crime, uh, including asset uh, recovery and, and, and generally corruption issues. So um, welcome, Caroline. We're really pleased to, to have you here. Um, Caroline, how can victims of foreign bribery be compensated in France, noting it's a, a civil law jurisdiction. And could you perhaps uh, explain a little bit to us the framework for victims to make claims before the criminal court? Hi, everyone, and, and thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to participate, and I was very interested in, in the previous presentations and, and answers. Um, and actually, I have so many questions, I think, for Sue and in and I, I found it interesting, the remark on, on jury trials for corruption uh, offences in the UK, while in France we don't have, uh, uh, we do have jury trials, but not for corruption offences. So I think it's, it, it, mm. it might be the, the topic of a, another future debate, but it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, yes, and, and, and I would also uh, like to, to comment on, on what was uh, mentioned before, I think we understand uh, compensation of victims uh, more generally in the sense of uh, uh, asset return to victims of, of corruption. Uh, but uh, before that, and, and thank you for your question, you have uh, uh, possibilities afforded uh, for victims to uh, be a legal party in a criminal or civil trials uh, in, in France and in other countries. And, and on this, I would like to point out that uh, we have talked about the OECD convention and the OECD recommendation, and and I think I, I should just mention the UNCAC um, mm -hmm. because it, it, it is, uh, everyone knows around uh, this table how uh, important this text is as well. And in the UNCAC, we uh, often think about Article 57, but before that, you have Article 53 for direct measures of recovery. And, and it, I think it's 
an often overlooked article of the convention and it's too bad because it's quite an efficient way mm -hmm. to uh, uh, compensate victims of uh, bribery, of foreign bribery and corruption. Um, I, I, I know that time is, is running, so I'll try to be uh, as brief as, as possible, but uh, in, in French law, uh, physical and legal persons, including states, can initiate action to establish uh, ownership of, of property or claims for compensation. And uh, it's either by uh, participating in criminal proceedings as a civil party or by instituting separate civil proceedings. And, and the person bringing a civil action on behalf of a state must only uh, establish, in accordance with principles of international law, his or her capacity to represent that state before French courts. And um, I, I briefly mentioned two minutes ago um, uh, civil proceedings, and I think it's also a, an interesting way because if the legal understanding of the victim under uh, French criminal law is not expensive, uh, technically speaking, one must prove that uh, it has uh, suffered a direct and personal uh, harm uh, from the from the offence. Uh, Compensation can very well be obtained before civil courts, and and mm -hmm. it's it's not an inter it's interesting because uh, where corruption is a criminal offence and offenders, uh, uh, I mean we we most of them are not consider criminal proceedings as the only or main way to obtain compensation for the injury, but um, uh, cases brought on civil liability claims that are in, and I would uh, I'm speaking under the control of uh, uh, common <laughs> law. <laughs> jurists and, and, and legal uh, technicians, but I think it's uh, close to, to tort liability. And in that sense, and, and um, you mentioned uh, my former practice as an attorney, but that's very technically what we did, uh, is, is mm -hmm. to, to have asset recovery cases brought before civil courts uh, on, on, with a, a legal standing that is easier to prove and a legal claim that is easier to establish than before criminal courts. And, and I'll be uh, very frank as well, uh, in terms of uh, money-wise and compensation-wise, it's also more often than not, more interesting before civil courts than it might be before uh, criminal courts. And mm. um, and very briefly, because I'm also <laughs> here to, to speak on behalf of my, of my government and and what we can do well in France, uh, uh, among um, um, us, uh, different faults, uh, is that uh, uh, victims' legal standing is not the only way to uh, ensure that we uh, take victims into consideration and in, in, in victims of foreign bribery. Um, the French legal provisions, for example, that, that create a right for civil society organizations to initiate criminal proceedings in cases of uh, international or transnational corruption is is another way. And and uh, I, I think you, you know that in France, NGOs can file a complaint if they are acting on behalf of a victim or in their own right. And, and um, some very well-known uh, cases of uh, transnational corruption in, in a larger sense of the word, not in, in the bribery sense of the word. I mean, there are some cases of bribery, but more generally, these some cases have been brought to courts on on the basis of NGOs' complaints, and and this is um, I think it's it's an interesting way again to take into consideration and to to uh, ensure legally speaking that victims are taken into consideration in, in foreign bribery cases, and I will just point out that this has been uh, 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 considered a good practice in the implementation of of the NCAC. Mm, thank you for that. And just um, quickly by way of follow up, I understand that in France there are new provisions on, on a, a social reuse mechanism and an asset return mechanism. Could you just spend perhaps two minutes uh, telling us about those? Yes, um, uh, indeed we are. Uh, uh, first of all, we're very happy <laughs> about uh, enacting the, the new mechanism on asset return. And, and uh, we have had actually discussions with uh, countries that have not uh, in, in, inscribed this into law, but that had experience in uh, returning assets to, to foreign, uh, foreign countries and, and, and foreign populations. Um, this, uh, this new law, uh, it, it 
it it creates a new mechanism to return ill-gotten gains, and its aim is, is to return some confiscated in procedures in criminal procedures of ill-gotten ill-gotten gains as close as possible to the populations of the countries of origin through cooperation and, and development actions. Um, and and so this has been entered into law in, in August, but this it will be complemented by a provision in the 22 and 2022 finance law. And we are discussing uh, actually with civil society, including Transparency International, uh, but also having informal uh, conversations with um, uh, foreign delegates who, again, who have had experience in this to to put into place the, the best modalities that we, we can think of to implement this new mechanism. And and yes, you, you also mentioned a, a, a new provision that expanded the prerogatives of the French authority that is responsible for managing seized or confiscated assets, and it's the AGRASC. Um, and now the AGRASC can uh, make available to associations, foundations, and organizations real estate that it manages and that has been subject to a final confiscation decision. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a decree that is uh, actually quite interesting that uh, determines the modalities of this mechanism and, and it's uh, based on public procurement and the AGASC decides based also on, on, on public and general interest. Uh, um, the way it, 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 it will make um, uh, available real estate to these associations and foundations. And I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, say very quickly that it's, it is, um, uh, I, I don't want to say that it, it, it's inspired, but it's actually in a way inspired from uh, an Italian law uh, on, and I, I think you, you, some of you may know this, um, uh, that that was it's an anti-mafia law and 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 um, and it's the idea of community restitution and it it is uh, applicable to corruption and criminal organ uh, um, organized crime um, um, offenses and and um, I know that the French government has had discussions as well um, with Italian representatives on how to. Uh, uh, to um, yeah, to take example on on what was done. I think uh, well, I think it's very much a watch this space um, with regards to that to uh, see how that see how that does actually play out. But um, it's it's good to hear uh, Caroline that <laughs> whether we're, regardless of where the inspiration came from, that there is some progress there. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, our final panelist is. Juanita Olaya, and uh, welcome Juanita, and certainly, you know, uh, last but not least, by any means at all, and uh, Juanita has spent many years working on this subject. Uh, she's a, she's an activist, a change maker. Uh, she also founded and currently chairs the UNCAC Coalition's Working Group on Victims of Corruption, um, which is doing really fantastic work, and I, I can say in the Asia Pacific region because uh, we, we, we've uh, uh, been part of some of that. Uh, she's also, you know, tirelessly been raising the need for us to see and deal with the human rights violations and corruption nexus in an integrated way, and that goes back to the point, you know, Anita was making earlier about, you know, we just can't have this this uh, a siloed approach to this any longer. Uh, and uh, she also has a private practice in Berlin and uh, is, is also now really interested in, in um, public, private and civil society organisational change. Um, so Juanita, welcome. And can you please tell us, you know, why you think it is just so important to repair the damaging impact of corruption and specifically foreign bribery, which is what we're talking about although it's all connected, you know, what happens if reparation doesn't take place? Just need to take yourself off mute. You're still on mute, Juanita. I have. That's it. Well, no, I think you're still on mute. Um, no. There we go. Now you're fine. Yeah. Thank you, Serena. And thank you, Transparency International, for inviting me to this wonderful event. Um, what happens if reparation doesn't occur? Imagine if you had a leaking pipe at home 
or in your village or in your city. And you left it out leaking, leaking water, water that you need to drink, to live, to cook. And instead of uh, repairing it, you went around finding the people who damaged it and uh, left the, the pipe to leak. That's what happens when you don't repair the damage that corruption causes. You leave the damage untouched. You leave the damage perpetually affecting citizens of these cities, of these villages, of these houses, of these countries, suffering from what a few people did. So when we're talking about reparation, um, we're talking about and addressing the victims of corruption, we're talking about collective damages most of the time. These things that are hard to, hard to, hard to depict and to make material, but that, are, but that you know they are there when they hurt, when you don't have them, when there's no trust in government, when, there's no, when, the, when basic human rights are violated when democracy doesn't work. You know, take the Odebrecht, uh, Odebrecht case that Edison brings back to our memories. That case was still not being repaired, caused harm not only in Mozambique, but also in a lot of countries, in about seven, eight, if not 12 other countries. In Latin America, for example, the Odebrecht case disturbed entire judicial systems that were bended on their favor. The mm -hmm. Odebrecht case, uh, bended entire uh, financial, uh, political finance campaigns on their favor. How many elections were blurred because of their intervention, were affected because of their intervention? How many key infrastructure projects were affected because of their intervention? So that's why I'm very adamant at uh, putting forward and clearly the human rights impacts of corruption. And I do agree with Anita and underscore what she says about the need to integrate those agendas. To, to, to connect them and to see them together because a company that bribes or that bribes its way into a market is not compensating its human rights. It's creating additional impacts by its uh, behavior. So we cannot separate corruption if it, as if it was a separate silo from other types of behavior, just like uh, avoiding taxes isn't as well. Um, I agree, however, and, and, and I and I am I'm, glad is not the word, but I'm relieved to hear about Drago's sorrow on not on not uh, having the recommendation recognize the victims as upfront as it needs to. But as others have also mentioned, that talks more about the mental state of mind at the OECD and less about the actual frameworks at hand to use for reparation because the frameworks does, do exist. Just as Carolyn reminds us of the ONCA convention that very clearly talks about the need for reparation and the need for any sort of reparation and the need to recognize the citizen's role in that reparation and their right to demand for that reparation. So the frameworks are there. And also, as Anita mentions, the business and human rights framework, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they are all very clear. So while we can still live without uh, the explicit mention in the recommendations about victims of, uh, of corruption uh, in the OECD uh, recommendations, we, um, we will continue to expect uh, reparation to happen because we cannot leave the pipes leaking. However, what happens is that despite the frameworks being there, they're actually not being used, as also Sue uh, mentions with very clear examples. They're not, very, they're not being used on practical reasons because you know, what you hear is, oh, it's hard to find the victims. Oh, it's hard to figure out a scheme of reparation that works. Oh, um, and citizens are not, um, are not being called uh, to represent their interests in many countries. Uh, which is possibly because it is the citizens, it is the victims of, of corruption that know how reparation can take place, that know what it feels not to trust their governments, that knows which uh, human rights have been violated through corruption. So they should be involved, not because it's nice to have them, but because they are the best ones, the best placed uh, to identify reparation and to enable it. Um, there's, however, a lot of hope, just as Carolyn uh, indicated, and I want to emphasize the, the amazing leadership that France has been having in this field, not only by using the framework, because as France has stepped up 
uh, enforcement, France has also have been stepping up uh, their efforts uh, uh, into addressing reparation and to enabling that assets come back to the citizens and, and are used for the benefit of citizens of the countries that are victims of 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 that of those uh, cases. So. Um, Indeed, as Drago also says, it's more about not wanting, which is puzzling because we're living in a paradox world where we're claiming uh, we're reclaiming the importance of things we're not willing to repair. So how come we talk about the with grand words about democracy and the important uh, the importance of democracy, but fail to know how to repair it? How can we talk grandly about the importance of trust, trust in our societies, but don't know how to build it? So we have to, we have to repair these pipes that are leaking. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah Juanita, thank you. Um, I mean, I guess, you, you, I mean, you've made it really clear that, you know, the frameworks are there. Uh, reparation is just not happening. Um, so is it, as, as Drago suggested, is it, is it political will? Um, what is it? Why is it that uh, it's not happening? And, and more importantly, I guess, in, in just a couple of minutes, what's it going to take to move ahead on this? It takes the Carolines of this world. It takes the many Carolines mm -hmm. of this world. It, it is less than political will what is needed because I meet, I see very often prosecutors, judges, lawyers, companies, company officials, people working on sustainability issues that are determined to make this happen. And those are the ones that make it possible. And so it takes, it just takes about someone really using the frameworks at hand. Uh, so it doesn't need to wait for big legal reforms or for high level politicians to, to take decisions. It really takes for the people with, with their instruments at hand to make it work. Um, it takes uh, using the laws that are there to enable citizens to take part in this, uh, to, take, to, to, to use their standing, uh, to use their voice, to be involved. Um, so it's very easy. It, actually, I think it's more like a mental problem. It's like a mental change. It's a small one. It's not a big one. Most of the time, it also becomes very clear for many people when it hits home. So my 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 main recommendation is use the frameworks at hand. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, um, well, I wanted to thank you all. This has been an incredibly rich discussion. We're now going to move to a couple of questions that have been put in the, uh, uh, in the chat function. And uh, Drago, there's a question for you, actually. There's a couple of questions. The first one, Drago, for you is, uh, quite a contentious issue, I think, but um, the question is, uh, you know, um, should there be more emphasis by the OECD and the private sector to avoid regulatory arbitrage when it comes to, to bribery? And it then suggests, uh, you know, do we need an international anti-corruption court uh, with an court has been widely debated and uh, um, you know I, I'm not sure that's what we need but I'm very interested to hear from you Drago. You know, my, po my position this is very clear you know we have enough rule international rules we have enough uh, let's say legal framework to do things we just have to do them. The problem we, we, which we face today is not only in the area of compensation. I agree more, and uh, I was seeing thumbs up from your other panelists. Yeah. Uh, this, this does not only apply in the area of compensation of victims. You see, uh, Juanita has said this is a small mental problem. When we were discussing this, uh, it was quite a big mental problem, especially for me. <laughs> but you see, I was so happy today to listen to Caroline, and I would like to say something else. You know, I was bragging so much about this issue that I finally made some of the countries. Uh, agreed that we will start a separate action on let's say and start develop something uh, which would lead us to enhance uh, possibilities for victims to be compensated and i really hope that i can count on caroline on this one uh, because mm -hmm. we are this week we are discussing the french reports so i will i will immediately jump on the french delegation when they come in in half an hour or one hour 
<laughs> and let's say the last question is the Global Anti-Corruption Court. Yes, unfortunately, yes. We are, we see so many cases where, let's say, the top decision makers from many countries are not being brought to justice in their countries simply because they, the either the investigators or the prosecutors or judges, they do not feel strong enough to do it, or they're simply not enabled to do it. We have, we have cases, let's say, uh, let's say when somebody from country A bribes somebody in country, top politician in country C through intermediary in country B. When all the procedures are, are gone, are done, we have the following situation. In country A, the judge said this is not a bribery. In country B, intermediary is still sitting in jail. In country C, the top politician has been sentenced for corruption and released by, by the constitutional court in a clearly politically motivated decision. So mm. we have we still have impunity. And as as, mm. as much as I really hate to say this, I don't see any other way than let's say to really to introduce the rule of law against everybody in the world. And when I say everybody, I mean the top politicians, because let's say the low, the small fish will always be fried in their nation in the countries. Then, mm -hmm. then we will have to get we'll have to need we'll need the anti-corruption court. Of course, not all countries will join. You have some countries who simply do not care about that, but uh, maybe the rest of the world will do. And uh, at least for those countries who will join, we might we might bring in a bit more justice as uh, today. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that. There's there's also a follow up question or, or, or not a follow up, but a second question for you, Drago, uh, which I think is from uh, my, my colleague at TI Berlin. Um, the question is, you know, what, what can be done? Oh, oh, sorry, Juanita, did you want to add something to that last question? Yes, uh, Serena, thank you. Just briefly on the on the international court uh, idea. Uh, I, I think it's 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 an interesting idea. It, it would have been interesting 30 years ago. Mm. But it's not anymore. It's not useful anymore because the problem we're having today uh, is not is, is not be able to be addressed by an international court that we will not be able to put together to work in the way we need it to work. As Drago mm -hmm. says, for the few cases of high level officials that are not bring, be, uh, being put up to justice. Um, the problem of enforcement today remains national remains national and it needs to be addressed at the national level. I think it's just a, a very romantic and appealing idea that, but it, I think it would uh, distract, create a lot of distraction from the real uh, work at hand that we have, which is strength national judicial systems. Mm. Well, I couldn't agree more coming from Australia where we have an enormous amount of work to do. We don't even have a national uh, uh, integrity commission. So uh, um, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, uh, an international anti-corruption court would perhaps be the perfect distraction from uh, progress in Australia. So, uh, but uh, I, I may be sharing too much. Um, uh, Drago, there was uh, another question for you. Um, what can what can be done in countries like Germany, where you know the the protected legal interest is is you know often the integrity of office, and so then it means that individual victims cannot be compensated. And the question is, you know, is the working group, the OECD working group, looking into this issue? Well, I have to say, that Germany is changing too. You know. Some 20 years ago, let's say the rules which were protecting the, let's say, the legal interests of offices were much stricter than they are today. So things are changing there too. Of course, it doesn't go from what day one to day two, but things are moving. Uh, of course, some time will be needed, but I would say in terms of the, let's say, of German's activities in our, our group, we consider Germany as one of our best member states. It's not perfect, of course, because nobody's perfect, but Germany is doing quite well. As soon as we will manage to push through with the standards, let's say, also in this area, in the OECD, then of course Germany will align. I don't have any doubts on that. The only problem is, let's say, we will have to be very clever. We will have to find, we will have to start thinking out of the box because we tried, let's say, to with, with the clear cut provision on compensation of victims, which did not work. So we will, first of all, we will have to collect all the forces in, in the form of countries which have something in place which are doing it, let's say, like United Kingdom or France, 
and uh, some other countries which are really supporting this idea in the working group when we are discussing the recommendation. And when we will form this group, then maybe we'll get to, to, to some ideas how to do it. Uh, no, it's very typical for Germany. You know, Germans, Germany was the last country in Europe to ratify the UNCAC. Uh, but when the UNCAC was ratified, Germany basically more or less implemented everything what's in, in the convention. So this is German style. You know, they, they first do it and then they ratify it. We have plenty of countries mm. which first ratify the convention and they do it after 100 or 200 years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I would not see Germany as a big problem. For sure, they will be getting everywhere where the, the standards, standards will lead them. Mm. Yeah, thank you. That's very interesting. And I just wanted to thank uh, Anita. She shared a link in the chat function on um, the report that the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights um, did and presented to the Human Rights Council. And this goes to this issue of uh, very much, you know, joining the dots between the business and human rights aspects and the anti-corruption aspects. And um, I just want to commend and uh, everyone involved in the production of that report, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cracking good report. So thank you. Um, now, uh, and just encourage any other participants, if you have questions, please do put them in the chat function. Uh, I actually did have a question and um, it, it really was something that came to mind uh, as Sue was speaking. Um, and of course, thinking about the UK's uh, the SFO Foreign Bribery Act, which of course Australia has um, kind of picked up and uh, and really modelled uh, amendments to our Corporate Crimes Act on. The problem is great work's been done by the Attorney General's Department um, and we have now uh, a draft, draft amendments very similar to the UK. The problem is it's sat on somebody's in-tray and hasn't been introduced to Parliament for the last three years. Nonetheless, I do just want to commend uh, the, the, the hardworking staff at the Attorney General's Department for progressing that. But one thing that crossed my mind is if this legislation gets up in Australia, um, it's similar to the UK and the US in that it, it, it will introduce a deferred prosecution agreement scheme, a DPA scheme. And my question to Sue and to others is, do you think um, there is a risk or in fact an opportunity that victims of foreign bribery are likely to have a better chance of compensation under a DPA scheme um, or in fact will that potentially you know let the companies off the hook and and uh, make the chances of compensation even harder and I guess I'm thinking about what you were saying Sue about you know the the criminal process and the court process and how long it goes on, but it just struck me and uh, I, I see one need to make, have a view on this as well. So DPA is good or not so good for uh, uh, victims of foreign bribery? Perhaps Sue and then Juanita and if anyone else wants to comment. Very, very pertinent and very good question, uh, Serena. In an ideal world, um, there would be community impact statements put to any court that is overseeing a DPA. So you would have a third voice because at the moment, DPAs are very much company and uh, the prosecutor negotiating behind closed doors, even where it's approved by a court, you know, they go to the court. And I mean, what we've seen in the UK is a bit of rubber stamping, frankly, uh, mm. you know, so I think we would have to work very hard as civil society to bring that about. But, you know, lots of lawyers we've spoken to in the UK uh, context think there really is a case for third parties to be able to put representations um, to break this kind of cosy um, link. But I, I think, um, you know, it's a really, really interesting question because the other thing that you get with DPAs is, you know, in courts, certainly in the UK, victims do have a space at sentencing to come and say, you know, this, they give an impact statement. And there is no mechanism in DPAs for that. So if you could find the victims uh, in the UK, you know, to present to the court, they would get more of their day in court if it's a criminal case, mm. a DPA. Mm. But I mean, I think that's really important work to be done. Um, I mean, the UK 
regime does have compensation specifically as one of the things that must happen for a company uh, to get a DPA. And I think that's good practice. Uh, the fact it hasn't happened, in, you know, is being very disappointing. We would have liked to have seen a lot more of it, but it is there in the law. So I would definitely say if anyone is in that situation where a country is putting in uh, place new laws about DPAs to make sure that it is modelled on the UK's uh, in so far as the compensation provisions. Mm. Uh, thank you for that. That's very helpful. I'll, I'll certainly be taking that on board when uh, uh, we, we see where this gets to. Um, Juanita, if you could just uh, add your comment for a minute or two, and then there's a final question, I think, for uh, Caroline, and then we'll do a wrap up. Other than underlining each word Sue just said, we need to remind ourselves that about 80% of current enforcement happens through out-of-court agreements, as a report that published by the US OECD a few years ago uh, confirms. So it is a, an incredible opportunity to address corruption, reparation, and, and I emphasize reparation because compensation in, 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 uh, in, in Roman law countries has, has a different connotation. Um, mm -hmm. It is important to involve people's voices and citizens' voices in that negotiation. Um, and of course, the, 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 the trick lies in, you know, how to how to open up those procedures so that citizens' voice can be brought in. I think Sue's recommendation of bringing at least impact assessments is, is really important and really needs to be heard of. Um, but there's also another issue is that some jurisdictions have a, a practice of uh, giving too much voice to the perpetrators in those agreements, far much more than the victims. The perpetrators end up having a say in the destination of the assets that are involved or in the fines, in the use of those of the of the funds. And I think that th that is questionable because that has stopped uh, and that has made difficult in, 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 in important cases, like in the case of Obiang in the US, the actual delivery mm. and late delivery of, of the funds for the benefit of the citizens. So it is important to be aware of uh, sufficient transparency practices, of involvement of citizens' voices, um, and also of not be, uh, of, uh, be, uh, taking care of the balance of how much power and voice the perpetrators vis-a-vis -vis the victims have uh, in those agreements. It's a matter of rule of law. Um, and just, 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 to, just to make sure it's a, it's a really a good opportunity and we need to make it in ways that also doesn't make prosecutors' lives much more difficult, which also is also mm -hmm. a fear some of them have. It doesn't have to be more complicated. It actually can be much easier. And I would quote the examples we have lived where uh, DPAs have been delayed or have been made complicated uh, because of the absence of that. Yeah, great. No, thank you. That's that's extremely helpful. Um, Carolyn, there's, there's a question for you. It has many parts, so I'll let you just choose which particular part you want to answer because we've we've literally got two minutes. But um, it's, it's really about the French mechanism giving NGOs standing to file complaints on behalf of victims. And this, the suggestion is it's, you know, it's one thing to put in place the legal procedures to enable that, but what's the experience been so far in ensuring inclusive participation by victims? And, you know, have there been any standout lessons about, you know, which NGOs are giving, given um, uh, standing in court to speak on behalf of victims? So I guess it's really a question around, you know, are NGOs really best placed to, to speak on behalf and provide that voice to victims and, and what have you learned from that? Sure, um, I, I do think we have uh, uh, extensive or actually material experience in, in NGOs uh, bringing cases to light uh, or to justice. Uh, by by uh, being the authors as, of of criminal complaints, um, I'm, I'm sorry I was uh, caught up in your question and then I was caught up in my answer and and <laughs> and I'm not sure I'll, I'll be very precise on on answering the question. It's it, it the, was the question is our NGOs best place to uh, yeah I think it's it's really I think it's really a question is. Um, you know, what lessons have been learned about which NGOs are given standing in court to sure. speak on behalf? So I guess, 
maybe sitting behind that is is it only the big international NGOs who get to do that or are there others or, or what what have been some of those learnings well uh, uh, not everyone it, it's based on um, um, I don't know how to say that in English actually I'm, I'm, I'm uh, thinking while I'm speaking but it um, it is based on on not every NGO can can bring corruption cases before criminal courts. It depends on obviously uh, the uh, interests that are defended by the civil society organizations. So, talking about corruption, I'm thinking about Transparency International. I'm thinking about Sherpa. I'm thinking about Antico, and and I, I I'm sure that some of you know. Uh, that uh, there was some uh, contentious and debate about um, uh, whether the government was providing adequate uh, uh, relevant authorizations to NGOs to, to bring those criminal complaints. So technically speaking, uh, those NGOs, one, must be defending, defending the interest uh, uh, at heart, um, and two, yes, they, they have to have, um, uh, for lack of a better word, an authority authorization uh, that is delivered on a periodic basis uh, to to have this legal standing um, I again like I, I, I and I, I think I would be happy to to discuss it further with uh, transparency international France that has uh, some very relevant experience in, in bringing those cases and uh, uh, it, and I think what's important also to mention in this mechanism it it's it's not only that we authorize it, it's that it's put into law. It's literally in the criminal uh, procedure code, or is it the mm. criminal code? But it, so it's, it's yeah. I think that's a very important point you make because uh, having it in law then means that it's not at the, um, the, the, the whim or the approval of whoever happens to be in power at that particular time. All right, well, we we are um, at the end of our, our session, so I'm going to um, just ask each of each of our panelists to close with one recommendation. If it was a perfect world, you could have one recommendation um, to progress to progress enforcement of foreign bribery and victims rights. What would that be? And uh, I, I apologise. It's you know one recommendation, one minute to kind of get it out there. So um, Anita, I might go first to you. Great, thank you. Very briefly, I think back to what I was focusing on, which is the promise of regulation in the area of human rights due diligence. If we do it well, and it includes a provision for civil liability. And back to Juanita's point, weak rule of law, places where there's weak governance and weak democracy or lack of it, using this as a mechanism, um, will be able, victims will be able to address the fact that there is corruption as well as human rights abuses. I'd also just say that the OECD national contact point system is another non-judicial remedy mechanism where you can, again, look at corruption and human rights hand in hand when, when people seek remedy. Great, thank you. Um, Drago, what, what would your recommendation be? Clearly not an international criminal court, I don't think, but uh, or corruption, anti-corruption court, but what would you suggest? I would suggest that we simply uh, strictly enforce the provisions of the legislations which are asking for confiscation of process of bribery, domestic or foreign one, that we, and that we really strictly uh, take into account the, the rights of victims when deciding on what to do with the confiscated process. And here I have to say that, uh, let's say, in the OEC working for bribery, we call the DPS and NPS uh, non-trial resolutions. I would have to say that I see much better chances that we make a really important breakthrough in this area than in the typical court decisions. Because what we saw until now is that, let's say, countries work with each other much better in when they discuss the NTRs. Uh, this also goes, also, let's say, reflects in the cooperation of the companies, which are basically suspects. And I think that this would be an ideal, let's say, terrain to check some of the ideas also in compensating the victims. Mm, mm. No, thank you. Very, very interesting. Um, Juanita, you, you, you got quite excited before and I think spilled the beans.
is a little bit on your recommendation. You, you suggested use the frameworks we have, but is there uh, something else you would like to add as, as a recommendation? So you get kind of two bites at the cherry. Uh, yes, I would, I, I, would, I would also add another suggestion. Reparation is also possible out of court. Governments decided and companies decided to repair the damage that corruption has happened doesn't need to wait for the responsible ones to be found and to be identified. Repairing the damages of corruption as they happen, just as, as, as mitigating the damages, uh, the human rights and the environmental impacts that we humans make in our surrounding will make our lives better. So we can do it without trials. We should do it now. Mm -hmm. Do it now. Very good. Uh, and uh, Sue, if I can, if I can uh, jump to you for your for your hot recommendation. Uh, so my hot recommendation is that Drago <laughs> is um, <laughs> a volunteer. You Drago for this one, <laughs> uh, with your community of the willing in the working group on bribery, uh, create a pilot project uh, for uh, some willing countries to commit to doing a proper impact assessment of the harm of bribery, including multiple stakeholders, experts, local NGOs, uh, INGOs, uh, on some specific DPAs coming up. How about that? Think it's possible, Drago? Well, thank you for putting so much responsibility of me on me, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm running a bit out of time because it will be only one year more since I'll be sitting here, uh, but I'll do my best that I can promise. Thank you, Drago. I think all of us have confidence in you absolutely to do your best and uh, we know you can get things done. Even in, even in a year, there's progress can be made. So thank you. Um, and Caroline, uh, over to you. Well, it's a bit harder to make a recommendation from a government standpoint uh, <laughs> because I'm, am I making a recommendation to myself or to my government, or to, to everyone else? I'll, I'll just, uh, I, I won't be very original. I'll, I'll just uh, relay uh, some things that have been previously said, included by Juanita, that I, that we very much agree with, is to uh, better implement uh, the framework in general, but. Uh, we talked about the UNCAC, we have discussed about what can be done under the OECD, uh, but Sue mentioned the GFAR principles, and, and you also have the, some G20 principles on, on asset recovery and return, and, and I think my, my main point would be, and this is a position that we have in international fora, is um, to um, have mechanisms in place, or at least to ensure that is that there is adequate and effective implementation of the many, many principles and, and international provisions that exist uh, to, to uh, take into account uh, and into consideration victims in their uh, compensation. Thank you. Well, well, thank you all very much. And, um, and, and my thanks to, to uh, those who've joined us. I mean, I think it's been a really rich discussion today. Um, Clearly, there is much to be done, but I think there we've heard both Julina. sides of the the gloom and doom, but also where there is some hope and, and opportunities for the future. And I think what really struck me is we, we really need to keep our focus on, on the fact that, um, you know, that bribery is not a faceless crime. You know, we need to keep our focus on, on, on the impact that bribery and corruption has on, on the lives and livelihoods of communities and the most, most marginalised. And as, as we've heard from Juanita, you know, how do we continue to ensure that those that are directly impacted do have a seat at the, ta at the table and are part of those discussions and decisions around what needs to be done? Um, we know from our own research at TI, we, we need to keep our pedal to the floor in keeping the pressure up on uh, enforcement. And we must, you know, continue, as we heard from, from Anita and others, to make sure that we're, we're really 
narrowing this uh, understanding or, or perhaps widening is appropriate better term of the nexus between corruption and human rights violations. They can no longer be seen as, as siloed events. And I would suggest that we also need to recognise uh, the other aspect in terms of environmental degradation as well as, as very much being part of this um, if you like, triangle of, of you know, human rights violations, environmental degradation and corruption risks, because we know bribery and corruption has devastating impacts on the natural environment. Um, so my thanks to all of you and um, all power to all of you for the work that you do. And I thank you very much for the work that each and every one of you do and for all of those that have joined us on the call. And um, that's not bad, it's 9.31, so uh, one minute over. And uh, to all, all, all our uh, participants who've joined, um, please uh, join me in, um, in, in uh, congratulating uh, and, and thanking all of our panelists. So thank you very much and have a nice, a nice day and a nice evening. Thank you.